Okay, welcome to our unit number two on data management. What we're going to do here is to just look at data tables. How should they be designed? There are some interesting related statistical concepts that go with the data tables. So if you don't design them quite right, your statistical analysis will not work. In the design of tables, there are implied statistical concepts already, and we uh, should know those. Then we'll talk uh, generally about good practices in collecting your data, in organizing your files, and I'll share some tips and tricks with you. And then we'll try all this out with a lab number two on basic data management in R. Some people actually do everything in R, but I like the combination of using both Excel and R to do your data management and organization. So I think um, probably everybody has an intuitive sense of what a data table is. Maybe just to give a simple example, let's say we have a forestry experiment with a number of different sites. Uh, maybe it's a harvesting experiment. So I have different forest stands in different locations in the landscape. And I put out some plots. And um, maybe then I try out different harvesting treatments. Let's call this A and uh, we randomize them so we're going to get into this a little later in more detail maybe we have another treatment that's b I'll just put them here in random places and maybe we also have a control here there it is and i forgot the last one here but uh, we can do that too and um so you can now go ahead and record what you observe at these different sites. Let's maybe call this site one, this is site two, and this is site three. So I think it would not be unreasonable to whip out Excel and um, you know write this in a nice orderly way, just like I've done it here with color-coded harvesting treatment. And then we record the occurrence of, of a red listed species of interest, uh, just to give an example. Uh, so we have a count of 12 under harvesting treatment A for, for this plot and so on. So they are repeated. And we also do it at different sites so that we have some representation for different conditions that we find through the landscape. So I'm just entering, I'm just going into the field. I survey those uh, plots that I put out there. And then I'm going to enter my numbers here maybe 21 here, uh, only six, eight from there, and so on and so forth. So you can uh, do it like that. Just to give you an example, that this is actually not uncommon. This is a data set that uh, collaborators from South America sent to one of my students. Um, so that's exactly what they've done here. They have their treatments, they have a series of trials, and uh, everything is color coded and uh, uh, treatments and measurements are recorded in this type of format. But this is actually not a particularly good way to enter your data. You know, it's actually good to have these uh, site layouts, but you're creating a world of trouble for yourself by entering the data like this. So what you want to do instead is enter your data in a standard data table format. And let me create a little bit of space here. Um, so we're going to uh, create a standard uh, data table. And it looks like this. We have obviously our columns. And all the information uh, goes into rows. So we start, we have uh, so separate columns for any kind of information that we have. So what we have here is a site. We also have a treatment. We have our measurement. And uh, one important thing that I would always suggest uh, you include as well is an ID. So in this case, that's a plot ID. Let's call this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you can do the same for site two. So we have one, two, three, and so on. And now we are creating an ID field that says, okay, so this particular plot has a unique uh, identifier that is site one, plot one. And then if we move to the next one, it would be site one, plot two, and so on. And then we continue with site two, plot one, uh, and so on and so forth. So next, we actually need to uh, repeat this uh, right here. So we have site one, site one, uh, site two as a separate column. We also have a treatment. I'm going to put those in colors. So that's an A, that's an A. Uh, then we have treatment B for this row. 
And we finally have our measurements, maybe 17, 21, 18, and so on. So I'm not going to put all of this down, but you get the idea how this looks like. And to be even more specific, this is already a unique ID here, but I'd like to add also all the treatments that we apply here. Uh, so in this case, it would be A, B, and A. So that ID by itself is a complete representation of your experimental design, what you've done, where within site one it is, and what treatment it received. So that's always a good idea to have these complete IDs. So this is what my student eventually had to do, convert this into a standard data table format. And I'll show you how that looks like. Just as we uh, talked about in that small example that we drew out on the whiteboard. Order, we haven't talked about that yet. That's a, that's a very handy thing. I'll uh, explain that what that means to you in a minute. As you can see, this can be a little bit of work to uh, put this together. So we have uh, almost 7,000 observations, 7,000 rows. That's the only way that you can analyze data. So you have to do this step, but that's there's the power of R. So what may look like a copy and paste job that will take you weeks and months, uh, that can often be done in a few minutes <laughs> if you know how to program R. So this type of transformations can be programmed. So that's one of the benefits from this class that we learn how to do this. Now there's a couple of other things in that data table that I don't like. Um, I already told you that I don't like the ID. It's not very informative. The other thing that I don't like is that there are numbers um, for treatments and categorical variables. Uh, that can cause a lot of problems in your analysis. So it's always a bad idea to have numbers representing categories. So let's fix this. So what we're going to do is we are creating a new set of uh, variables here that we want to fix. So 10 is really not a measurement. This number has no meaning. So what we're going to do is we are going to type S here for site and we combine this with the end sign and then we add that value. So now it's S10 instead of 10. So there can be no confusion. This is a categorical variable. And we're going to do the same uh, with the wrap and with the C plot here. I'll just pause the video so that you don't have to watch me type. The other thing that we can also do now is I create a better ID. So I'm calling this ID2. Uh, we have the different cells, A1 and, and then we have a little um, dash. Then comes the next cell we are interested in with a little dash. And if we hit enter, uh, then we have this unique ID that captures all the information in the experiment. What we're going to do now is highlight this whole thing, double click the corner, and we have a proper data set with informative IDs, what's called a factor variable or class variables for the variables that are actually not numeric, that are not measurements. So now these are formulas, and in order to get rid of the formulas and make this permanent, all you need to do if you work with a CSV uh, file is to save this file. So we're going to do this here. Once you reopen this, so I can, uh, let's close this. Uh, reopen this. So now if I click on it, this is plain text. Uh, that's permanent, that's good. We can actually get rid of this old stuff here. Uh, this is really not what we want. And we're going to paste in that information over here instead. And the ID we can put to the front. And this is how things should look like, um, where you have an ID field that really contains all the information about your individual plots and individual trees. Um, and then you also have everything separate. So that is really required. Oh, wait a second, what is this? Let's get rid of that column. Uh, everything needs to be separate uh, for analysis. So the last thing I think I owe you here is an explanation what what the deal is with the order here. And um, the best is probably I, I show you an example for this. So the order column actually refers to the order in which you take measurements in your experiments. So that may vary a lot uh, depending on what kind of research you do. So this is an example for a forestry trial. So the way the student arranged uh, the order column is that he starts here at um, one corner of the trial, walks 
along those uh, trees, measures every tree, then turns around here and goes back and measures the next row, and then again turns back, measures the next row, and works the way through the experiment until they're done and they should come out like this. And uh, so to guide this, that student actually put a stake every 10 trees uh, so you have a you have kind of a visual marker and you have a double check whether you're still on the right row in your data entry sheet once you go through here so you can see this starts with one then you have a stake at 10 20 30 40 and really all you have to do is sort your uh, data entry sheet by uh, the order number and uh, you can you always have that double check that you enter things in the uh, right position the, the reason why um, you do this, for example, in a forestry experiment, is that you don't want to walk all the way back from here to the beginning and then start the next row just because your data sheet is arranged like this. Now, it depends quite a bit on what kind of experiment you have, how you would have that order. For example, if you have a greenhouse trial like this one, it may not make sense to do that reverse order in alternate rows. So in this case, it might be good to just order your blocks or give your blocks a number. Um, so this might be observation one. You start here and you do it like you read a book and then you go to the next one and you continue there. Uh, so that's, that's another way uh, you might want to put the order into your data sheet. And uh, just to give yet another example, if you do, let's say, wildlife surveys or transacts um, with a vegetation service or something like this, your order of entry may actually be determined uh, by a hiking trail that's available. So depending on what you do, that order column in your data entry sheet may look very different and may not have anything to do with your actual experimental design. So if that's the way you set yourself up, uh, you save yourself a lot of work. You have a perfect data table that's ready for analysis. And at the same time, the only thing you need to do is to um, order your a data table by that order column and you have a perfect data entry sheet so you can start right here at the beginning of the trial and work your way through it and take your measurements and then if you if you just want to visualize how your experimental design looks like or you want to look at a particular site uh, or a particular seed lot or replication or treatment you just uh, order it by uh, those experimental um, design considerations now, one other thing I'd like to mention is why I recommend informative IDs. And um, i give you a, a little example here of out of my own PhD research when I was a graduate student. I did a genetic study on uh, population structure and population genetics of red alder. And I relied on a Ministry of Forestry trial that was here and that had collected all these seeds throughout the province of British Columbia and then planted them at this one site. So this was very nice and convenient. I could go there, sample all those different genotypes and then use genetic markers to compare uh, them in terms of similarity. And you can build dendrograms like this, uh, which indicate genetic similarity. And one of the interesting things was that I found two groups here, so one in the north and one in the south. But there was one thing that was odd. So in the original analysis, these two were swapped. So the 61 clustered with the southern group and the 19 clustered with the northern group. So we all scratched our head for a moment. But then the penny dropped when the scientist from the ministry planted those seedlings here at the trial. He obviously looked at the back label upside down, right? So if it's handwritten, it's very easy to confuse the two. And we all had a laugh at the at the Ministry of Forest Scientists, who was on my supervisory committee. And he was a very, very senior guy. So uh, he had established hundreds of trial over a 25-year career. If he makes these mistakes, then any, anybody will make those kind of mistakes. There are now actually people who address this issue with genetic markers, and they found that easily 10% of everything that's ever planted is mislabeled. Now, this was easily fixed, and I actually had some good ideas why that structure was there. So I had some explanation about historical refugia and uh, how Red Alder recolonized British Columbia after the last Ice Age. And I could make predictions of what should be on Queen Charlotte Islands. Uh, there's also outlying populations in Idaho, so I had a pretty good idea what those genotypes would be. So that's a true hypothesis. 
and it's testable. I just needed the money and the permission from my supervisor to actually go collect data, not just from BC, but range wide. So after some arm twisting, he paid the expenses for a rental car and two months off. And I actually traveled from California all the way to uh, Alaska, including stops at Idaho to collect all these uh, additional samples to see if that was correct. And um, the one thing I didn't learn from the ministry guy is to create better IDs. So I did the same damn thing. So I just labeled my samples with numbers and marked those on a map where I collected them. And then after I came back, there was a good half year of work of, of sample preparation, DNA instruction, sequencing. And then finally I was done and um, my map was gone. I couldn't find the map and that was the end of that. So publication, that analysis could not proceed. I wasted nine months of my life and the hypothesis that I was so proud of is to this day unresolved. So feel free to learn from my mistakes. And um, what I should have done, obviously, is, uh, you know, if I have a seed lot, I can also say roughly where it came from. So general region and then a, a location ID, maybe the closest town where I was. And those IDs can also be constructed here with those left and right commands. So you can just pick the first letter from a region. If that's unique, then I add my seed lot number and I could take four letters from the location name, for example. So then I still have short IDs that can easily be written on a label or a vial or a sample bag. And um, then everything's clear, right? Even if I lose my map or my record sheet, I could reconstruct it from this, but I couldn't reconstruct it from the plain numbers after nine months. I just truly and honestly did not know anymore where that came from. And um, while I'm at it, I might as well give you another general tip, another mistake of mine that sunk another thesis chapter. I really had quite a bit of a hard time. That was related to my file management and file organization. So if I look at my Red Alder PhD project, I had all kinds of weird subfolders and my file names, wow, you know, H2R, HRAC1, HRPR, uh, what the heck? And there were also a lot of these files. So if I look in any of these subdirectories here, there's actually a ton of subdirectories in those, and then in those maybe yet other subdirectories, and they're all filled with these files. And that actually turned out also to be a little bit of a problem because at some point I had to defend because I was running out of money and running out of time. So I figured, well, this last chapter I'm just going to do, once I'm done with writing up my thesis, I still, you know, there's still half a year until the defense actually happens. So I put the research on hold, I wrote up what I had, and then half a year later I was going to pick this up. But I could not make any sense of this anymore. So I really did not know what all this was. And eventually I, I just gave up. <laughs> so that's another thesis chapter that never saw the light of day. So that's probably also something that you want to avoid. So what I can recommend after many years of experience is that um, a, a shallow directory, so that doesn't have a lot of subfolders, maybe two or three levels at most, and then ordered folders in there. You can do it by date, but it's usually best to create a sequence of analysis of smaller steps and then give them really descriptive names so that you know what it is. One other clever thing, I got that tip from one of my PhD students. She zipped everything up, so every folder was zipped up and only if she wants to access it, then she unzipped it. That's then a folder that you are currently working on. And the advantage with this is that you can go back to something, you unzip it, you uh, maybe modify it and play around with this. In the end, you realize, oh, this is actually not really what I want. But then you just delete that folder, right? And you still have the original as a zip file. Um, so that works really well. And if, if it's some modification that you like, then you just rename this to 4B, update it on a particular date and uh, zip that back up again as a correction or as an improvement of, over what you've done before. Uh, so those are good data organization and data management practices in general. And that might work very well for the products too, especially if you want to get advice from me and the TA. I will likely ask you, okay, um, can I see the file from this step? So if you can find it right away, that's really good. If you have 
something that looks like this on your memory stick and it takes you even just five minutes to find it, that's very awkward, right? So sitting five minutes in my office or being five minutes on a Zoom call looking for your files, that's awkward. So try this. So uh, if you run into trouble with your projects, we very often need to go back and trace back where the error may have been. So these are just a few pro tips on the side for you. It's not going to be part of any quizzes or exams.